Welcome again to the media ministry of Covenant of Grace Bible Church. This week, Pastor Mark continues his series in the book of Colossians as we look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 and 25 and see some of the costs associated with ministry. Pastor Mark actually begins this week with a verse from the first chapter of Philippians. So let's take your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 1, and be ready to follow along with Pastor Mark. You know, I want you to go with me to Philippians chapter 1 this morning. We're still in Colossians, but I want to start in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, and I want you to go to verse 29. Verse 29. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it says this, and it's speaking to Christians. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. What I want you to understand as we begin this message this morning is that as a Christian, as a believer, two things have been granted to you. Number one, that you would believe. And I want you to look at that. It's been granted to you to believe. And there's a second thing that's been granted to you. To suffer for His sake. We often are so surprised when things go wrong. Myself included. Myself included. And you know, I, and I have to confess to you that I, I, I was ashamed of myself this week. I had to go to the Lord in repentance and forgiveness because we've been going through some, and I'll be honest with you, some tremendous financial struggles the last, probably the last month. We've been hit with bills in, in, in cars, in dental, in every different area. And it has really gotten to me. And I've been trying to figure out, Lord, how, how do I do that? How do we pay these things? How do we, how do we come up with the cash to take care of these kinds of things? And, and finally this week, I just, I, I kind of lost it. And I got angry. I even got angry with the Lord. I got a little upset. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to serve you. I'm working two jobs. I, Lord, I, I've had it. And you know, the Lord had to really deal with me because it's like He said to me, don't you realize you've been granted two things? Number one, you've been granted your faith to believe. You've been given a relationship with me. And number two, you have been granted the privilege to suffer for me. But I want you to see what he says. How does this suffering come about? And this is what the Lord hit me with. Look at verse 30. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to, me, here to be in me. The reason why Paul suffered was because of ministry. The reason why he suffered is not just because he was a Christian. It's because others knew he was a Christian. And they knew he was a Christian because he was involved in serving people in the name of Christ. I have come to the conclusion after 19 years of ministry that ministry is not ministry unless you pay for it. I don't believe that there is such a thing as ministry that does not cost you anything. Now, don't make this more than it has to be. If you go out of your way to help someone that needs help, you have just paid a price. You went out of your way. If you have been inconvenienced to minister to someone, you've paid a price. And that price was you were inconvenienced. Some of us may pay with our finances. Some of us may pay with our resources. Some of us give up our time. Others are inconvenienced. But there is always a cost to ministry. And if there is no cost, it's not ministry. Christ ministered and it cost. There was a sacrifice. And so if you think that you can be involved in ministry or can be serving people and not pay a price, you are sadly mistaken. There will always be a price to pay. And what we have to understand and what the Lord had to teach me this week, remind me of this week, is this. You've been granted the privilege of suffering in ministry. You know, what's really interesting is as I had my tirade against the Lord, some of you looked shocked, but yeah, we, we really went at it for a while there. The Lord brought me to repentance and to confession, and I said, Lord, I'm very sorry. I, I apologize for being ungracious, for not being thankful, for doubting you, and all these things. You know what happens the next day? Totally out of the blue, completely out of the blue, a check arrives from New Zealand. New Zealand. 
Do you know anybody in New Zealand? Well, we have a family that's friends of ours in New Zealand that we send CDs to because they, they don't have a church down there. And so they gather their neighbors and they listen to these CDs. Anyway, they send this check. Unbelievable, but this thing takes care of basically all, of, all the financial struggles. It just, it just wiped them out. I mean, but you know what the Lord had to do with me? I'm going to bring you to that crisis point, and then I'm going to bust you, and then I'm going to bring you to repentance, and I'm going to show you that when you are involved in ministry, it is a privilege to suffer. The suffering of ministry is the ministry. The suffering of ministry is the ministry. That's why so many Christians don't want to get involved in ministry because they don't want to suffer. They don't want to be inconvenienced. They don't want to give up their time. They don't want to give up their energy. They don't want to give because they don't want to have to pay a price. And so that's why they don't get involved in ministry. Well, Paul is going to be talking about the suffering that is involved in ministry. And I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to deal with verse 25 this morning. Finally, after 23 verses... Paul now begins to talk about himself. For 23 verses, he's been talking about Jesus. And now he begins to tell us a little bit about himself and a little bit about his ministry. And I think it's appropriate that it's taken this long in this book for him to talk about himself because the book of Colossians is not about Paul. It's not about you and me. It's about Jesus. It's about making Jesus preeminent. It's about making much of Christ, not making much of us. And so for 23 verses, he's been talking about Christ, talking about the gospel. And finally, he begins to tell us about himself. You know, I think there's a principle here. You cannot make much of Christ and make much of yourself at the same time. You can't do it. You can't make much of Christ and make much of your church at the same time. You can't make much of Christ and make much of your ministries at the same time. Our responsibility as Christians is to make much of Christ. And as we make much of Christ, as we glorify Christ, as we worship, as we adore Christ, all these other things will start to take place in the way that they should. But Paul waits for 23 verses to begin to talk about himself. And as he begins to talk about himself, he talks about ministry. Now look at what he says in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. In this verse, Paul gives us a perspective on suffering in ministry. And he's going to be talking to those people who are involved in ministry and who are paying a price for that involvement in ministry. And again, you may not be giving your life for Christ. You know you're not going to become a martyr for Christ. But maybe you're being inconvenienced. Maybe your ministry is taking time that you really don't have. Maybe it's taking money that you really don't have. Maybe you are driving for miles in order to minister. And with a high price of gas, you're paying a price for that. Well, whatever it may be, Paul wants us to understand that there is a perspective that we need to have on suffering and suffering in ministry if we are going to reap what God wants us to reap out of ministry. In essence, what Paul is going to show us here is this, is that the suffering of ministry is the ministry. In other words, what you endure in terms of a cost in your ministry is the ministry. And if you're enduring no cost, then really you're not involved in ministry. Because in the Bible, all ministry is sacrificial. It always costs something. You know, I think that there are perhaps two kinds of Christians. I hate to say that, but as I observe the church, I think there really is. I think there are those Christians who have come to Christ, who have come to Christ, and they're weak in their faith, and their whole philosophy, their whole way of looking at the church and looking at life is that the church and Christians are here to minister to them. Then you've got other Christians who have grown in their faith, And they are involved in ministering to others. And so you've got those that feel everything's about them and others who are trying to focus and minister to other people. Well, Paul is going to talk about those today that are involved in ministry. I think he's going to talk about those that want to be involved in ministry but may be a little afraid to get involved because they realize there is a cost to serving Christ. Well, let's go ahead and look at what he has to say. He's going to give us three principles here. 
and how we should look at suffering in ministry. Number one, we must see that our ministry induced sufferings are a cause of rejoicing. Now, understand, we're talking about ministry induced suffering. We're not just talking about the fact that you've lived, you lived your life and you got cancer and you're suffering because you have cancer. Now, yes, that's suffering. And God has a lot to say about that kind of suffering. Today we're talking about those sufferings that are induced because you are involved in serving someone else. Ministry induced suffering. Have you ever got involved in ministry and been burned? Anybody here ever been burned in ministry? Anybody here ever? I mean, I have been burned in ministry my whole life. Praise God, that's the way it's supposed to be. Don't be surprised. That's the way, that's the design. You're supposed to get burned in ministry because God's going to do more in you than He will ever do through you. Paul says this, Now I rejoice. Look at verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He is suffering for their sake. He is in prison. He's in jail in Rome because he is ministering the gospel, because he is preaching the whole counsel of God to these people. Because Paul won't shut up, they put him in jail. And he still is talking or writing. And he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. You know, we've got to have the perspective in ministry that sufferings are part of God's design and we need to rejoice in the fact that we have the privilege of suffering, of paying a price for ministry. You know, the early church considered it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the apostles went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. You know, there's, there's reasons, I think many reasons, but we're going to highlight five reasons why you and I should rejoice in our suffering. Number one, it's this. First, suffering in ministry brings us closer to Christ. Suffering in ministry brings us closer to Christ. Go with me to Philippians 3, verse 10. Philippians 3, verse 10. Here's Paul who's in jail. He's in a Roman prison writing the book of Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, the prison epistles. And look at what he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says that I may know Him. This is his goal. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. Paul's goal was that he would know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. It was a goal in his life to suffer with Christ. The whole idea there of knowing the fellowship of His sufferings was that Paul wanted to enter into suffering with Christ. He wanted to suffer for Christ and for Christ's name because that suffering produced a fellowship between Him and the Lord that could not be produced otherwise. When you suffer for Christ, you get to know Christ in a way that you could never know Him otherwise. You get to identify with Christ in a way that you will never identify with Him. That's why suffering is a part of our lives, and especially a part of the lives of those who are involved in serving people in the name of Christ. The second reason why we should rejoice when we suffer in ministry is because it assures the believer that he truly belongs to Christ. If you don't suffer as a Christian, there's only a couple possibilities. Number one, you're not a Christian. Number two, no one knows you're a Christian. I mean, as I look at Scripture, that's the only two reasons I can find for not paying a price for being a Christian. You're either not one or no one knows you are one. Look with me over at John chapter 15. Look at John chapter 15. So when you do suffer for Christ, rejoice. It's a mark of assurance. Look at John chapter 15, verse 18. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You know, if you as a Christian are being loved by the world, there's something wrong. That means you are accommodating to the world philosophy of life. And that's why the world loves you. 
But when you confront the world's philosophy of life with a Christian philosophy of life based in the Word of God, the world is not going to like you so much. The world is going to hate you. And that is a mark that you belong to Christ. Look what it says in verse 21. Verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Again, look what he says. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Unless, unless we are not a whole lot like Jesus, right? I mean, they'll persecute us when they see Jesus in us. And if we're a Christian, we're to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if we're letting that show, then there's going to be some sort of price to pay. If you're becoming like Christ, you're going to be involved in ministry. You're going to be serving someone, somewhere, someplace, sometime. And the Bible says that you will pay a price for that. And that price is going to be an assurance that you are a Christian. Look over at Matthew chapter 10. Look at Matthew chapter 10. This is going to be one of those messages that is going to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Look at Matthew 10, verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It's not enough for the disciple that he become... It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub... How much more will they malign the members of his household? Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever been maligned, made fun of, falsely accused for the name of Christ? Now, in your heart of hearts, if you say no, let me ask you this question. Why not? Why not? If they called the head of the household Jesus a devil, why are his followers not called devils and demons? Why? See, again, you have to come to to this, this, ask the, the tough question and you come up with a tough answer. Are we as closely identified with Christ as we would like to believe? Go with me to 2 Timothy 3.12. 2 Timothy 3.12. 2 Timothy 3.12. Now, this doesn't mean that we make ourselves purposely obstinate and try to get people not to like us, but the whole fact of the matter is this. Especially in the culture in which we live, you can't confront your culture and people that adopt this culture. You can't confront that with Christ and the Bible and not be afflicted in some way, shape, or form. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, now look at this, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. You're going to be harassed in some way, shape, or form if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Now, turn this all around and here's the flip side. If you are suffering persecution, harassment, some sort of affliction for being involved in ministry, that is a sign that you do belong to Christ and that you are a disciple, and that you are living for Him. So suffering in ministry ministry is also an assurance to the believer that he truly belongs to Christ. Third thing, reason why we should rejoice when we suffer in ministry is because it brings a future reward. Look over at Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5. You know, it's interesting that the the whole idea of rewards means this. If there are people who will receive a reward in heaven, that means what? There are also people who will not receive rewards in heaven. Correct? When you give out rewards, that means someone's going to get one, someone's not. Correct? Well, who's going to receive the rewards in heaven? Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed. Now, that means happy. Makarios in Greek. Happy are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Righteousness. 
For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. Rejoice when you pay a price in ministry. Rejoice when when people misunderstand you and talk about you and don't like you. Rejoice when your time is eaten up that you don't have. When you're giving away money that you don't have. When your energy is being depleted even. Because there's going to be a reward for our service for Christ. You know, go with me to 1 Corinthians 15 very quickly. 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, it says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because of this. Listen to this. Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Every little thing you do, God notices. And He's going to reward us for our service and for suffering for that service. There's a fourth reason why we should rejoice when we suffer in ministry. It's because this kind of suffering produces godly character or spiritual maturity. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete Lacking in nothing. Now, now, all trials will do this. But if all trials will do this, then especially those trials that we incur in ministry are going to produce godly character and spiritual maturity. And finally, the fifth reason why we should rejoice when we suffer in ministry is because it results in happiness. Remember that Matthew 5 passage where it said blessed in verse 10? That's makarios. It means happy. God says, you know what? You'll be happy if you suffer in ministry. I want you to go with me, though, to 1 Peter chapter 4. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. You know, God kind of reverses the price tags on things. We think that we will be happier if we don't involve ourselves in ministry and we avoid the whole suffering trap. We think that rather than except God giving us greater responsibility in our ministries, which is going to increase the fire under us and cause us to be attacked even more, we think, you know what, we'd be happier if we just stayed away from that. The Bible says, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Look what it says in First Peter chapter 4, verse 12-14. through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. You are happy because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. When you pay a price for serving Christ, the Bible says you will experience great happiness and exaltation Because the Spirit of God actually rests on you in a way that He would not had you decided to avoid that whole issue. You know, suffering for the sake of Christ, for taking stands on the Word of God, is a painful thing. It is a very painful thing. And the pain does not ever go away. But there is a happiness that comes when you pay a price in the name of Jesus Christ. There is a deep, abiding joy to be identified with Him in suffering. So Paul says, let's go back to Colossians 1, verse 24. The first thing he says is, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now, here's the second principle. Number one is we need to see our ministry and do sufferings as a cause of rejoicing. Number two, we must see that our ministry and do sufferings will benefit others. He says, look what he says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Whenever we suffer, it's not suffering in a vacuum. As though this is just for me. When you and I suffer for Christ, it is for other people as well. Now you that that are parents, sometimes you get caught in the trap. We get caught in the trap of thinking that the best thing we can do for our kids is not ever suffer as a family. 
Let me ask you this. How will your children learn how to deal with financial crises if they never see you go through those crises? How will they ever learn how to deal with sickness and death unless they see you have to go through that? How will they learn to deal with the struggling and the suffering? And ask the Rosecrans. I tell you what, one thing after another, isn't it? And we think somehow that we're going to avoid all that suffering. Your kids are going to suffer as much or greater as you. Well, how are they going to learn to do that unless they see mom and dad suffer and see mom and dad come through that? Your sufferings as parent is for your children. Our suffering as Christian is so that other Christians will learn how to suffer. And so Paul says that his suffering was for others. You know, John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, said this about suffering and ministry. He says this, God appoints His ministers to be sorely exercised. Those of you that are going to become elders as we move through this process, better listen to this. God appoints His ministers to be sorely exercised, both from without and within, that they may sympathize with their flock and know in their own hearts the deceitfulness of sin, the infirmities of the flesh, and the way in which the Lord supports all who trust in Him. You know, I've shared with the guys that are going through the elder process, and I've told them that they need to share with their wives as well, is that the minute you become an elder or a leader in the church, you show up as a big blob on Satan's radar screen. Temptation will increase. Trials will increase. The fire gets hotter. I, I, I know that when I, when I stepped out of just being a police officer back into the pastorate, I mean temptations I never even thought about as a police officer. Just start ripping me apart as a pastor. Having to deal with the deceitfulness of sin. God revealing to me who I really am. You know, it's amazing when I look back through church history that some of the greatest preachers in church history suffered through intense depression. Spurgeon. Many, many of these preachers. And it's because as an elder, as a preacher, as a pastor, they were confronted daily with their own deceitfulness and their own sin and having to deal with that. And there's this temptation to quit because to be quite frank and honest with you, it would be easier to quit than to be a... It really would. People say, you know, man, it must be terrible to be a police officer and wonderful to be a pastor. I look at them and say, let me tell you what, it is much more stressful to be a pastor than it ever is to be a police officer. Number one, I don't have a gun. I mean, I can't do to you. I mean, I shot a dog too a week ago, you know. It barked at me, raised it, you know, came at me. And it's like, that's, I, mean, I, mean, I had church members do worse than that dog did. But, you know, I don't have a gun, I don't have a badge. I can't say, I'm going to take you to jail unless you sit down and shut up. You know? When you minister for the Lord, it, it, all the, the fire gets hotter. But it's for other people. None of us who know Christ and minister for Christ suffer in a vacuum. Our sufferings are for other people. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And so you need to rejoice in the fact that what you're going through is being brought into your life so that you can minister to someone else. Someone along the line is going to need what you are learning in your sufferings. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions, now look at this, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Your suffering is not just for you. Your suffering is for someone else down the road. And God says the comfort that you're receiving from me right now is the very comfort that I want you to give to someone else down the road. You're not suffering just for you. You're suffering for other people. And so Paul recognized that his ministry-induced sufferings would benefit others. You know, my boss has a saying that goes like this, no good deed goes unpunished. No good deed goes unpunished. You know what? I think it's true. It's true. No good deed goes unpunished. Ministry has a cost attached to it, and that cost is suffering. Punishment. The world will punish you for ministry. Go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Let's just look at Christ's example for just a moment. See if you feel like this. In John chapter 13, Jesus gets His disciples together at the Last Supper. They're in the upper room. 
It says in verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands and that He had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside His garments and taking a towel, He girded Himself. You know what's interesting here? is Jesus never should have been the one to wash feet. That was the lowliest servant's job. And so who took the job? Jesus did. Jesus did. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll put the towel on, I'll take off my clothes, and I'm going to begin to wash your feet. Now, if you look at, at, at verse, chapter 13, verse 4, he got up from supper, he laid aside his garments. Jesus had to take off his good clothes to serve. You know, there's a lot of people that don't want to serve people because they don't want to take off their good clothes. You know why? Because they're afraid of getting dirty. They're afraid of their lives getting a little bit tarnished. You, know, you can't minister to people in this world without getting dirty. You, you can't minister to people whose mindset is completely foreign to the Word of God and, and, and be afraid that, that you're not going to get some dirt on you. You're going to have to deal with people where they are and you may get dirty. That's why you need to be in the Word of God protecting yourself. But he took off his good clothes. And then look, it says he girded himself with a towel. This says in verse 5, Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Smelly, dirty, scaly, probably have disease in the feet. Diseased feet. I mean, he, he does the, the most menial, lowly job there is. He's ministering to people. There's a cost that is incurred in ministry. Not only does he do that, but he got wet and he got dirty in ministering to people. If you look at verses 6 and 7, he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. He's, Jesus is completely misunderstood. Peter doesn't understand why Jesus is going to do this, and Peter begins to argue with him. I guarantee you, you get involved in people's lives and you begin to minister to people, they will misunderstand you. They'll misunderstand your motives. Oh, who do you think you are? You, I, should, I mean, do you think I need this kind of ministry? You, I mean, come on, man. Just go minister to somebody who really needs it. I really don't need what you've got to offer. You're going to be misunderstood. You know, good people in the church are going to say, well, who does she think she is up there singing? <laughs> you know, she thinks she's got some kind of voice? Oh, she's doing it for her own glory, not for God's glory. You're going to be misunderstood by people when you step out and minister for the Lord. But not only are you going to be misunderstood, people are going to argue with you. People will argue with what you are trying to do. You know, someone has said that preaching is like no other job in the world. Every Sunday you get up, take your clothes off, knowing that you're going to have to do it next week. Now, what, the, what he meant by that was this. You become completely vulnerable because you are sharing with people what you believe the Word of God says, and they can sit out there and judge what you believe. How many of you would like to get up here week after week and tell everybody else what you believe and what you think and let them pass judgment on it the rest of the week? Try it sometime. See, Jesus is misunderstood. He's argued with. And then in verse 11, look at this. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Did Jesus wash the eleven and skip Judas Iscariot's feet? No. Have you ever had to serve someone that betrayed you? Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever served someone that you knew would betray you? That's tough, isn't it? To serve someone that you know is going to hurt you. There's a price in ministry. Now, if you look at verse 12, it says this. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to what? Wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. That doesn't mean that we all go around here and take our shoes off and we're all going to start washing feet. What it means is we need to serve the same way Jesus did, realizing there is a cost and a price to pay for ministry. There's a cost and a price to pay for ministry.
Well, let's go back to Colossians 1.24. We'll look at that last principle. The last principle. Number one, we must see our ministry induce sufferings as a cause for rejoicing. Number two, we must see our ministry induce sufferings as an opportunity to serve others, as benefiting others. And finally, number three, we must see that our ministry and due sufferings provide us with an opportunity to identify with Christ in suffering for the very people it was His pleasure to suffer for. Let's look at Colossians 1.24 again. Notice that it starts, in at least the numeric standard, it says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. The word now in Greek is noon. It's a word which is a connective, a connector. It is connecting what is going on in verse 24 with the preceding paragraph. It's making a direct correlation between what was said prior to what's being said now. Now, let's look at what was said before. Look with me, if you would, up at verse 19. Well, this is what we talked about last week. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, Christ. It, and... By extension, it was the Father's good pleasure through Christ to reconcile all things to Himself. And if you look down at verse 22, and yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body. Remember last week we said that it was God's pleasure to save you. God did not begrudgingly and reluctantly save you. It was His pleasure that the fullness of who He was existed in Christ. For all of eternity. And it was in His pleasure that even as Jesus became the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, that God's fullness still reside in Christ so that Christ could go to the cross and save you. It was God's pleasure to save you. He didn't look at you and look at your sin and say, oh man, you? You want salvation? I I would have took Him, but you? Oh, I made a promise. Let me save you. Okay, yeah. But you know what? You're going to sit over there in heaven. Because, I, quite frankly, I think you stink. But I'll save you, I promise. That's not how God saved you. It was God's pleasure to save you. God rejoiced in saving you. Well, it was God's pleasure to suffer for you. It was God's pleasure to have His Son suffer for you. And so what Paul is saying in verse 24, with that in mind, look what he says. Now, in light of that, I too rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. You see, we've got to look at the people that God died for and we need to say to ourselves, you know what? If it was God's pleasure to die for them, if it was God's pleasure to love them, God's pleasure to save them, then it needs to be my pleasure to serve them rather than a burden to serve them. Now, suffering identifies us with Christ, but look at what Paul says, and in my flesh... I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. This phrase has been a tough one. Do you know this is where the Catholics, in part, get their doctrine of purgatory? They look at this and they say, okay, Paul said here that he suffered and that his suffering filled up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So they believe that we need to suffer to help out the atonement a little bit. In other words, Christ's suffering on the cross was not enough. Therefore, we need to suffer in purgatory so that we can make up for Christ's lack of suffering. He didn't suffer enough for us. Well, that's where Roman Catholic theology gets its doctrine of purgatory. This is not what Paul's saying. He's just spent 23 verses telling us about the sufficiency of Christ because Christ is God in going to the cross and paying for our sin penalty. I want you to look at the verse very carefully in Colossians 1.24. Notice what it, the tense is. It says that he did his share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking, not what was lacking. He's not talking about the atonement. He's not talking about the cross. He's not talking about our salvation. He's talking about in filling up what is lacking. Let me ask you this. What is lacking in Christ's suffering right now? He is. You know why? He's not physically here. Christ can't suffer anymore. He's in heaven. He's glorified. He can't suffer anymore. The head can no longer suffer, but the body is here. The body does suffer. 
And in our suffering, we are making up for Christ not being here. And the whole point that Paul is trying to get across here is simply this, is that our sufferings on behalf of Christ are the very thing which shows people that Christ loves them enough that He will have even His own followers suffer for them. We don't make up for Christ's sufferings at the cross. Christ's suffering at the cross was completely sufficient for our salvation. We do continue Christ's afflictions. We do continue His sufferings. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And you'll, you'll get an idea of what this word fill means. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In verse 15, Paul is closing out the letter and he says this, Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. Now look at verse 17. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part. That word supplied is the same word that's being used for filled up in Colossians 1.24. Now understand what Paul is saying is this. Because, the, because you in Corinth are so far away from me and you are unable to help me because of distance, these men have supplied my need. Well, it's the same word that's being used in Colossians 1.24. And what Paul is simply saying is this. Christ can't suffer for people anymore. Christ can't show His, His love for people right now by suffering for them right now. He is no longer ever going to suffer again. So how does Christ fulfill that need for people to know that He suffers for them. He suffers through His people. We suffer on behalf of Christ. Now, here's what's interesting about this. He who suffered for us is in heaven. We now suffer in His place. And in suffering in His place, we fill up or we complete what is lacking in His suffering because He can't suffer any longer. I want you to go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. When you're suffering, this would be a good verse to remember. Two verses. Isaiah 63, verses 8 and 9. Look what Isaiah says. He's quoting God. Isaiah 63, verse 8 and 9. For He said, Surely they are My people, sons who will not deal falsely, so He became their Savior. In all their affliction, He was afflicted. And the angel of His presence saved them. In His love and in His mercy He redeemed them and He lifted them and carried them all the days of old. Look at that first part of verse 9 again. In all of their affliction, in all of their suffering, He was afflicted. Jesus suffers through us now. We're the extension of Christ's suffering. We make up for what Christ can't do because He's in heaven. A lost world looks at believers and they say, you tell me that Jesus Christ loves me. You tell me that Jesus Christ cares for me. How do I know that? Because we're willing to suffer for them in following the example that Jesus gave us in suffering for them. Look at Acts 26 on your way back to Colossians. Look at Acts 26. Acts 26. Paul is defending himself and his ministry and his faith to Agrippa. And look at verse 10. He's telling him the story of how he got saved. He says, And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Here's the Apostle Paul before he became the Apostle Paul. He says, I killed people. I tracked them down. I tortured them. I brutalized them. 
And now I want you to look at verse 14. Look how Jesus looks at these people. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? Me. Jesus wasn't the one Paul put in prison. Jesus wasn't being tortured. Jesus wasn't being brutalized by Saul. Who was? Christians. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting who? Me. You see, Jesus can't suffer. The world can't hurt or harm or cause suffering to come to Jesus anymore. So the world has to bring it to us. That's how we fill up Christ's afflictions. That's how we complement them. That's how we complete them. A pastor who was exiled in Romania in 1981 said this, Christ's suffering was for propitiation, our salvation. Our suffering is for propagation. Letting people know that Jesus loves them. Paul wants us to understand that if we don't have the right perspective on suffering in ministry, we will quit ministry. Some Christians will never ever start ministering. And Paul wants us to understand as he begins to talk about ministry that suffering in ministry is a cause for rejoicing. It's a cause to help others. And it's an ability to allow us to identify with Christ in a way that we never could as we complete His sufferings on this earth. The suffering that you endure in ministry is the ministry. And if there is no suffering, there's really no ministry. If there's no cost, there's no ministry. Part of ministry in Christ's name is that there's a cost to pay. When you and I are willing to give up our time, our resources, our money, our energy, we're willing to be inconvenienced, hurt, misunderstood, forsaken, argued with, abused, walked on, just to have the chance to minister to someone, we have finally begun to understand what ministry is all about. But if all you want to do is protect yourself and insulate yourself and keep yourself out of the fray because it might get too hot, it might get too tough, you're not understanding what Christ did for you. And you're not understanding the privilege that He's giving you and me to not only believe in His name, but to suffer for Him as well. You know, I know there's many of you that are paying the price. Don't quit. Don't get discouraged. Don't, don't pull out of the ring because it's getting a little tough. Don't, don't get out of the kitchen because it's getting a little hot. Hang in there. And for those of you who have never gotten into the fight, You've been content to stay on the fringe. You've been content to stay out of the fight. And you've been content to sit on the seat and just watch. You'll never, ever be as happy as you could be if you just jumped into the ring.